go to DSR, <coughs> which is, as I said, the kind of the opposite to the ERN. And again, it's a very, very, very simple choreography. You simply have a DSP who wants to send to a rights owner or to an administrator, administrator of rights um, information about usages, um, about revenue that's been generated to that, uh, uh, wants to send that information. Um, and it's called the, the um, sales report me message or the digital sales report, DSR. Now, there are two different formats that we've developed. Um, at the same time as ERN3 was developed, we've developed an XML variant of that, um, that, that sales report. It has proven with uh, the numbers of sales lines that especially streaming servers have to deal with, that that is actually untenable. So since then, we have developed a, a flat file version, which is sometimes called DSRF. Um, but since all the implementation work that we've seen lately is on the flat file, I typically call that DSR. The technical basis for this, it's, it's well, you can simply import those files into Excel as long as they're small enough. Um, it's a tabular, tabular uh, delimited file, um, which then also allows to, to contain multiple names in individual cells, so we have a secondary delimiter. Um, and we're using UTF-8, so you can deal both with um, our normal Western alphabets as well as um, dual, or triple, or quad byte uh, characters if that's what you want to do. And not that they're not normal characters, but uh, um, yes, <clears throat> you know what I mean. So, um, it, but it's a structured file. Um, th those files are broken into different blocks um, to describe what's the release that has been dis uh, uh, distributed. In many cases, you need to also describe what's the sound recording or music video or, or what, what's the resource that has been um, distributed. And then you have the sales and usage information. How often, what's the price, what's the revenue that's been generated, all those kind of information that needs to be provided. In addition to that, you then have summary information so that someone can see at a glance, well, this file actually provides revenue in the for five thousand dollars or fifty thousand or whatever the number of um, number may be that's being generated. And because we're talking about a flat file, you need to have a header and a footer so that people know when they've reached the end of the file. So that's how they look like. You have a header, you have summary records, you have what we call blocks. I'll come to that in a second and a footer. Very, very simple. Each of these blocks are then um, self-sufficient little units which describe what has been sold, distributed, streamed, or whatever the, the, the use case may be, and how often, for what price. But you can generate or read one block at a time without referencing anything else uh, um, other than the summary records, which are very few. Um, and then ingest those files. This makes ingesting this file so much easier than the, the XML file, which had been cross-references all over the file. Um, and we've seen quite a significant of update. There were um, discussions this week about how many companies have used that, and that was um, well over 100 companies are starting to um, use this format, have started using this, com uh, this format already. And again, like with ERN, we have defined different profiles because there are different ways in which music is being um, made available and different ways um, you need to then account for those uh, use cases. So we have a basic audio, which is your run-of-the-mill download or streaming services for all of those user-generated content sites. We have one profile, one that deals with specifically audio-visual um, stuff, not music videos, but richer audio video, uh, visual material. One that deals with not just usage reporting, but royalty reporting, so if you like, one step uh, further, and one that deals with audio broadcasting. Um, the current focus is on reports to works owners or administrators. The, the record label side is something that, um, for the first time at this meeting, we actually, with some 
Vengeance worked on, and hopefully there will uh, quite soon be an update to the DSR standard, which then will also allow reporting from a DSP to a record company. That still goes through the, the final phases of, uh, of testing and, 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 and refining, um, but should be out fairly soon. So this is how, how one of those reports looks like. Um, I know you can't see that, it's a bit, bit small, but I've just took one of the sample files, put that into Excel, and then just put the, 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 the bit of color on it so that, that it's easier to, to see. As Mark said, we'll send out the slides um, to, uh, to all of you so you can have a look um, offline. It's fairly straightforward. The next bit of communication that I'd like to touch base on, unless there are any questions on, on the sales reporting side, is the communication with music, with and amongst music licensing companies. That's the little yellow spur that went off on that diagram at the beginning. Um, that's a slightly richer communication, um, not very much, but it's where communication on mandates for sound recordings need to be communicated. Music licensing companies um, collect revenue or collect monies for the use of the sound recording all over the world. So the, the German um, MLC will collect the money in Germany, the French will do that in France, the British will do that in the UK, ReSound will do that in Canada. But if the sound recording actually um, is, is owned by a, I don't know, Japanese company, that some, the information from that label needs to flow to, say, ReSound. So that information will then flow from that label to the local MLC and then to ReSound. And that's what the message, the declaration of, um, how's it called? Declaration of Sound Recording Rights Claim Message, that's a mouthful, um, where record companies can declare their own repertoire to an MLC or an MLC can declare um, interest to another um, MLC. You can also revoke or you can query. Can you please provide me one of those uh, claims, please? The structure of that message, you will not be surprised to hear, looks, looks pretty much like an ERN. With one difference, it's on sound recording level, not on release level. So it's slightly um, turned upside down. But the composite to describe the sound recording and the composite to describe the sound recording in the ERN are very much the same. Identifier, people, title, and, and a bit of other information. Um, well, that's what I just said. And then there is the reverse bit of the, uh, of the communication. When an MLC has generated some revenue, because it was played in a pub in, in, in the UK, PPL, the British uh, MLC, has generated some revenue. It needs to now declare it to the Japanese MLC. Um, so they um, provide a um, sales report or a declaration of revenue, depending on what specifically happened. And that then can flow later on to the, to the label in question. Very simple. Very simple on this level. Um, there is significantly more detailed, of course, on those messages, but I don't really want to go into that much detail here. So at the moment, um, we've talked about uh, this part of the, uh, of the supply chain or the, the value chain. Um, but where does the data come from? We need to make sure that we actually have good data that can flow through the, through the system um, so that actually accurate accounting can be done, that consumers actually know what they, they want to, to um, use, um, that they can discover this stuff. Um, that's, that's an important part of the, um, of the whole experience. So slightly expanded uh, diagram we have um, the, the studio environment. Um, and when I say studio, I mean basically any kind of equipment uh, where sound is being recorded uh, uh, or mixed or, or mastered or anything. So it's, it's a very broad term. It doesn't only speak uh, to Abbey Road or the Revolution Studios here in Toronto, so something like that. But it's much broader. So what... RIN, the Recording Information Notification, does is it, it allows people to collect metadata at source and at the time of, of it happening. Um, 
in order to, to give consumers the data to buy their stuff and musicians, engineers to get paid and to get credited uh, uh, appropriately. So what are we talking about when we're describing a sound recording session? So here's a recording session in a room very much like this, as it looks like. Well, we're talking about when did that happen? Where did that happen? We're talking about who are the people, the engineers, the artists, anybody else who was in the studio that had any kind of influence that, that anybody wants to credit. Who, was, who wrote this stuff? Who are the writers? What's their shares on the writing? What's the equipment used? What are the instruments used? Did B.B. King play Lucille or did he play something else on that day? Because, I don't know, he forgot it in the, in the, in the hotel room. Um, and then where are actually the, 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 fi the audio files being located? Where are they so that we can um, <laughs> find them again? Now, I don't expect any person to actually ever see an, a RIN file. It's m under the hood as, as usual. You would find, hopefully, digital audio workstation equipment, either standalone little software applications or as part of your desk, um, that will collect that information for you. Um, but if that would be collected, and then if it would travel together with the sound from studio to studio, from equipment to equipment, and get enriched and enriched, and then when, it, when, when the stuff is being mastered and finally sent to the label and into the, into, into the, uh, into the wide open, uh, the music and data can hit the market together. It would go through a label, the label would then typically clean the data up and make sure that the data is correct, and it can then go out uh, to hit the market, and the information can also be shared, for instance, with MLCs, so that they get early knowledge about who was in the studio so that they can then um, pay the right musicians. can also go to, to um, other societies, music rights societies, publishers and the like, so that they learn of that information, of course. So we're working with digital audio workstation manufacturers, and um, it, it looks quite promising. There are already a couple of, um, of those uh, with RIN support out there. Um, and um, yeah, it looks quite, quite promising. Oh, th there's a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just thinking about how might this work with the uh, film and TV space? Because you, you'd mentioned music for AV, and uh, you know, I think for MLCs, you know, production music is kind of a, a bit of a piece um, that's interesting as far as how this works. So I'd be curious to understand where that's going. The honest answer is I don't know. And the reason I, I say I don't know is because we haven't done the analysis. Um, we do know that a number of our members uh, said, hey, we need to extend RIN to, to deal with video uh, material. Um, we do recognize, though, that the process of recording music and the process of, of recording audiovisual material is substantially different. So we first need to look at what the process is, is there to then see what we can do to RIN. Or maybe it's a VRIN. We don't know yet. We are in the process of, an, or at the moment, we're in the process of making sure that RIN, as it is defined for the audio space, is 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 going is to be rolled out. Um, but the VRIN, let's call it like that, um, is already in our, on on our on our plan to to look at next. So at the moment, I don't have an answer. I'm afraid. Hope, well, join us, and uh, and shape it.